Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. My name is Paul Singh. I'm the president of the Eye Centers of Racine Kenosha here in southeastern Wisconsin. And I'm going to talk about my experiences, my thoughts on SLT as a first line therapy. And then we've seen uh, for many, many years this topic come up. But I think now with a lot of the new data sets that have come out and this, this new appreciation for compliance issues, we're seeing SLT truly become more of a first line thought for many of our surgeons and colleagues out there as well. I do speak and consult for many of the companies in the glaucoma space and the anterior segment space, including LX, which is one of the manufacturers of one of the SLTs that are out there. I do uh, live in Wisconsin and work out in southeastern Wisconsin. I'm a cheesehead. I do have a cheesehead that fits over my turban, so I'd never forget my cheesehead roots as a Wisconsin native as well. We love our cheese, our beer, and we fry everything out here in Wisconsin. Uh, but I tell you, for being in private practice now for 16 years, also doing a lot of research as well, I treat a lot of glaucoma patients. And for so many years, all we had was drops for many, many patients, right? Until we were bad enough, we had drops, 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 new classes of drops, new top colors of drops, just combination of drops, right? But now with our toolbox expanding, we have not only SLT and lasers, but we have microinvasive glaucoma surgery and drug delivery. And our toolbox has expanded. It's become more robust. So it's kind of re- I think it re-emphasized the importance of earlier intervention, the idea of not having to wait till someone is much more, let's say, advanced or progressing before we think about intervening with some type of modality, whether it's laser or other options. And I tell you, for so many years, I, I was kind of a geeky glaucoma guy. I was kind of the guy on the left where no one really talked to. And then with all these MIGs and drug delivery and SLT now, because of all the new proliferation of technology, people actually want to talk to you. I feel like the guy on the right now where people actually want to hang out and actually speak to me now. It's an exciting time to be a glaucoma specialist. But it, the impetus, the kind of the, the trigger for so much of the technology that we've seen over the last, let's say, 10 years now is compliance. We all realize, and I do, is compliance sucks, right? No matter how good we are, compliance really is difficult. How do we expect our patients to stay on medications long-term, stay on the regimen that we prescribe, not complain, not forget? It's difficult. And, you know, honestly, there's a number of these reasons why you all have seen, I'm sure, in your practice, cost, side effects, the physical attributes, and then the, the kind of comorbidities that we see, such as ocular surface disease, all these different barriers to compliance make it difficult to treat patients long-term. And that's one of the reasons why I think SLT is another option. Physical attributes, if, if you really wanna have fun, have a patient in your office, just try to put a drop in their eye. It's really scary how and what people do to figure out a way <laughs> to put drops in their eye. It is not easy, but I've seen everything you can imagine. Alan Robin has some great videos on uh, patients trying to put drops in their eye. But it's also hard not just to physically put them in their eye, but once they go in the eye, so little of our drop actually gets in to the actual target tissues. 5% get into the target tissues because of the number of the barriers to the of our ocular surface, where the physical barriers, the, the conjunctiva, the lacrimal system evacuating, the tear blink reflex that occurs. Very, very difficult for patients or for drops to get into the eye, which is why a lot of, lot of drug companies have to increase the concentration of the medications or increase the residence time. But the problem is because of the chemicals, the BAK and other preservatives, we do see significant ocular surface disease. A number of studies have shown us between 50 to 60% of our patients in my hands, probably in my practice, probably 75 or 80% have an ocular surface disease, which would cause symptoms such as tearing, burning, pain, fluctuating vision, redness, photophobia. And all those symptoms, what they do is they cause patients to become lat law, a poor compliant or less compliant. And they blame the glaucoma drops on those symptoms as well. And if you look at data sets out there is a correlation, clear correlation to the number of bottles. The more bottles patients are on, the more risk you see of ocular surface disease, which again is a big issue because why? It can affect compliance. Here's a study by Bedouin that showed us that patients who had no ocular surface disease or dry eye disease, but 90% compliance rate. When you look at patients who had dry eye symptoms or signs, it went down to about 60%. That's a delta of about 30% there. Pretty significant difference. And this is why for me, I do want to control dry eye as much as possible. And part of that is hopefully getting them off the drops as, as well. Because what happens if they're not compliant? pressures can fluctuate, right? They don't take the drops, pressures go up and down. My attending, my mentor, Duke, when I did my training, Sanjay Rani showed us very clearly that patients who fluctuate about five millimeters of mercury throughout the course of his study here showed us higher risk of progression or visual field changes and using Goldman visual fields at the time than patients who had less fluctuating IOPs. If you look at studies like the AGIS, the Advanced Glaucoma Interventional Study, on the left here showing us those in the blue line who had less than three millimeters of mercury fluctuation in this course of 100 months had less chance of visual field progression versus those with the red line had a higher risk of progression who had fluctuated more than three millimeters of mercury throughout the course of the study. On the right really changed my mind a lot and made me appreciate fluctuating IOP. In the blue squares, 
those are patients in the age of study who had an average mean IOP of 10.8. And in those patients, those who, who did not fluctuate, who had less than three millimeters of fluctuation, had a progression over time of a 9%, right? Those who fluctuated more than three millimeters of mercury, despite having a mean IOP of 10.8, had a 30% progression rate. The same progression as if you had pressures of 20.6, right? So the more advanced we get, the more we see fluctuating IOP playing a role in visual field progression. What's also seen here is the OAT study. When we think of the OAT study as you know, patients who had ocular hypertension and those who progressed towards glaucoma, those were treated compared to those who were not treated. But if you look at the slope between the blue and, and the green here, the slope up to about five years was very similar between both groups. They both progressed, but again, very similar slope. But what happened at five years out, all of a sudden you see significant rise in the, or a significant more advancing slope or steep slope of progression in those who were not treated. It just took a long time to see it. The problem with earlier diseases or early studies looking at earlier glaucoma, we don't always see the evidence of poor compliance early on because we have structure function right disparity. You can lose a number of ganglion cells and nerve fiber layer cells before we see visual field loss. So a lot of times we don't see progression till more, till more time shows us. Again, just a matter of time in glaucoma, right? Here's a study looking at the HYDRA study, which is the HORIZON trials. They're four-year data, looking at patients who had the stent with cataract versus those who had cataract surgery alone. In the gray down below here, 2% of the HYDRAS folks who had HYDRAS cataract actually ended up needing incisional surgery, which is a kind of a surrogate for, for progression. Those who had cataract surgery alone, 6% needed incisional surgery. And a, a majority of those patients, actually more than half, and the people who progressed towards needing incisional surgery were mild at the beginning of the study. So that shows us despite patients having very similar IOPs, some more, more on drops, those who did not have a stent, we did see a significant difference in those who progressed to needing incisional surgery. Again, compliance might be one of the reasons why we see that. So the question comes up is really, are drops safer? I mean, is it, even though we tell our patients drops are first line therapy, we're telling them. The patients don't come in saying, I wanna do a drop first. We're dictating what is the standard of care. And I tell you, the more and more I think about it, looking at all these PGA related side effects that we see with lash growth and allergic reactions and thickening of the lid lashes and MGD, et cetera, I don't know if necessary drops are truly any safer than and as laser trabeculoplasty. So my, what's changed in my philosophy is this idea of what is controlled glaucoma. For many years, it was IOP, visual field, and nerves. And if they were stable, they were, they were controlled. But now I add quality of life and the potential for patients to stay on their current regimen as another piece of that, dis, of that definition of controlled glaucoma. So I don't want a patient to look like that. If they had come in with red, crusty eyes, complaining of cost, they can't remember the medications, that is not a controlled patient, no matter how good they look at that time in terms of fields or nerves or pressures, if they look like that, there's a high likelihood they're not gonna stay in the regimen and progress over time. And so that's the interventional mindset. This idea of not waiting till someone progresses, not waiting to that more advanced disease where our target pressure is 10 or below, where we do need to do a trab or a tube, it's addressing these concerns early on, whether with a laser or major other devices or other procedures, I think that's the idea of this interventional mindset as well. And that's where I think SLT has made a huge impact in my practice, especially as first-line therapy. Now, we do know that a significant resistance to Alplo is at the trabecular mesh work or the juxtacanalicular tissue, and, and a majority of studies have shown us that as well. But we also know that there's some resistance in the Schlem's canal and in the distal channels. In fact, Haiyang Gong has shown us 50% of our POAG patients have resistance or collapse of the canal and herniations into the collector system. So that's why some patients, let's say you get SLT in, maybe 20, 15, 20% may not respond the way you want them to, part of that could be because it might be collapse of the canal or the distal channels may be atrophied. And this is why also earlier intervention with SLT makes a lot of sense because over time, theoretically, if you have someone on glaucoma drops with BAK and preservatives for years and years and years, do we get apoptosis and scarring and fibrosis from the actual BAK? And if you're also using aqueous suppressants or diverting fluid away into, let's say, the uvascular pathway, are we collapsing the TM further by decreasing flow through the TM, and then we further collapse in the canal and distal channels. Now, I don't have great data to support that, but theoretically, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so the way SLT works, it's a Q-switch uh, nanosecond pulse frequency laser that works on the trabecular meshwork, the pigmented uh, trabecular meshwork as well, but it's in a non-destructive form. Considering ALT did cause significant scarring or actually trauma to the target tissues, looking at electron microscopy, just reminding everybody, it is a significantly more benign procedure, at least from a traumatic perspective, than ALT. 
And the idea is it's releasing cytokines into leukins. It's releasing a lot of the mediators that allow us to thin out the beams of the extracellular matrix, the beams of the TM, by releasing macrophages, et cetera, you're thinning out those pores, allowing fluid to leave, and also changing, some studies have shown changing the stiffness of the trabecular meshwork as well, and reducing the oxidative stress of the TM, which can further collapse and further stiffen the TM as well. So those release of cytokines binds and opens up those beams to allow better outflow facility. That's the kind of theory behind how SLT works. But the question as a primary therapy, not only does it work, is it efficacious, but does it also allow us to give us a benefit from a, a diagnostic potential? We'll talk about my thoughts on that as well. But there's been a number of study, McGillrath has shown us many years ago, back in 2006, comparing SLT to latanoprost, right, the, the PGA, showing a similar efficacy over one year, about a 30% reduction. And you're gonna see with multiple studies out there, we see 30% of reduction is a very common theme, which is very similar to what we expect from a topical PGA. Cast did his med versus SLT study, showing us again, no difference in terms of clinically significant difference in a statistical difference between SLT and meds, but better chance or less worry of compliance issues in the SLT group. Melamed showed too long-term efficacy about a year and a half, again, about a 30% reduction from baseline with SLT, uh, and again, reduce medication burden. Jindra in 2007 showed, uh, presented at AAO, a paper showing us again, 30% reduction, but over five years showed significant longevity. And that's important too. I think a lot, a lot of the patients in the study were actually more mild patients, less time on topical drops. And I really believe if you have earlier adoption of SLT, you have better longevity because you have healthier tissues, target pressures are usually higher. Number two, you have less chance of TM fibrosing and collapse of the canal and distal channels over time. And of course, the light study really did change a lot. I think it helped us it was a prospective randomized control trial that Gus Guzzard and his group in UK did a fantastic job published a couple of years ago, about 350 patients per arm. What he found was that 90 plus percent of patients got to target pressure in both arms. So, so efficacy was similar between SLT and a PGA, Lutanoprost, which is what we expect and we've seen in other studies. What we did find was that 75% of patients in the SLT group did not need drops post SLT for three years and more patients needed more drops in the drops in the drops group, of course. But the most important thing for me was this, patients in the SLT group, none of them progressed to needing incisional surgery versus 11 patients required a trabeculectomy or other subconjunctival surgery to maintain their target pressure. Again, a surrogate for progression. But what's important is also, this, even though the pressures were equal, compliance might've been the reasons why they were progressing again. It was also a significant benefit in terms of cost savings uh, from the UK, because again, if drops do cost significant, a lot of money. Now there's other studies looking at replacement therapy. There's a number of patients, even though SOT may not be first line, if you have someone on a PGA, there's a good chance, about 85% chance here in gender study, that you're gonna get them off of that PGA. And of course, you had two or three more meds, you, you still have 60 or 50% of getting them off of uh, two or three meds. And that makes a lot of sense because compliance is so poor. You look at data sets out there, when you add a second or a third drop, patients become less compliant. So when you do an SLT, why would you get you know, people off of more than one medication? It's not that SLT gave you 50% reduction, but it's because they were probably not taking their medications that they ended up not needing the two or three medications. And I've had that happen routinely, a way to get them off of more than just the PGA. Again, here's another study by Francis showing us in a pre-op average of 2.79 drops after SLT or a year down about 1.5. So you're gonna get them off at least that one medication, which can be a significant benefit from compliance cost and of course, ocular surface disease as well. Again, people with previous ALT, there's a number of my patients who had ALT 10, 15, 20 years ago, and now are coming back and SLT does work here, showing about a five millimeter mercury additional reduction of pressure when added to a, an ALT patient historically, again, over 50, over 26 weeks here. So pretty good studies there. And I think it's another important to, topic is circadian rhythm. Can we control that nocturnal IOP? Studies have shown us that there might be a rationale for controlling nocturnal IOP because blood pressure goes down at night and the eye pressure tends to go up, that can decrease ocular perfusion pressure. And here's a study showing us at nighttime, being able to control that nocturnal dip, that spike in IOP, potentially in some patients could give us a benefit over topical drops. Again, here's another study showing us adjunctive medication. 70% of all patients with SLT had an IOP of three or more millimeters of mercury, even in an adjunctive setting. So again, primary therapy, SLT works, but as an adjunct, it works as well. But you see how it doesn't work as well as if you do it as primary therapy, because when you start out with a fresh native eye, higher pressures, you see a significant reduction in pressure and longevity might be better as well in some patients. This is a video here using the Tango Reflex here showing us kind of a good view, like, like MIGS is important, 
good view of the TM. If heavily pigmented TM, I turn the power down until it gets champagne bubbles about 50% of the time or so. So a lot of times I'll start with 0.5 or 0.6, go up or down, depending on how much pigmentation there are. I do about around 90 to 100 shots for the 360. I do 360 degrees at one time. I don't do 180. I think if they had really bad, heavily pigmented TM, I might do 180, but majority of the time I do 360 degrees. And if it doesn't work, if it great, if it works, then I go ahead and just leave them alone and repeat if need be. I wanna quickly just talk about this idea of, can SLT give us a diagnostic benefit? In other words, if SLT works primarily at the level of the trabecular meshwork, does that tell us if it doesn't work, there might be some resistance in the canal or the distal channels? It might be. And does that affect us when we're trying to make a decision on what makes a stent, canal dilation, a cutting procedure? And so we found, we looked at our eye stent data, our original G1 eye stents, and we looked at a year follow-up. We had some really good data showing us eye stent worked really well, but we looked at our cohort, a subgroup analysis of our SLT patients. The top are the people who had a good response initially to SLT. The bottom were the patients who did not have a significant response to SLT. And what we found is people who had had a good historical response to SLT tended to have better reduction, additional reduction of IOP with an eye stent and had less chance of needing topical drops going forward at a year out versus the people who had a poor initial response to SLT tended to not have as good a response to, to eye stent or additional reduction rather, and were on drops more often than the people who had, a, had previously had a good response to SLT. So SLT may have been a predictor in our, in our case, again, this is non-published, our own cohort of study, our cohort of patients, but it may indicate that it could give us an idea of where the resistance to outflow could potentially be as well. And so for me, the patient selection is anybody with an open angle. Patients who have open angles, octopotensive, POAG advanced patients, mild patients, patients with secondary glaucomas, pigmentary, pseudoexfoliation, steroid responders, even combined mechanism glaucoma patients, patients who let's say post LPI who are still not controlled, if you see the, if you see the TM beautifully, that's a great option to try on patients as well. So there's a significant large population of patients with a mild, moderate, severe that can help. And of course our risks, Again, compared to a lot of other surgeries we do, or even drops, I think these risks are relatively low, but there are risks and inflammation can happen. IOP spikes, of course, can happen. We check the pressure half an hour after the procedure. I do give them a topical drop of bromonidine, et cetera, to help make sure that the pressure doesn't spike. And I do give an NSAID. There are recent studies that show us that maybe topical NSAIDs may give us a slightly better benefit uh, in terms of IOP reduction and also help with pain and that can happen after the procedure as well. But again, IOP spike and in transit inflammation is probably the two most common things you may hear and see. Um, I do have, I have heard of CME being listed as a risk factor. I haven't seen it, but theoretically, if you have inflammation or diabetic, let's say you could potentially get CME in the back of the eye, something I don't see, but it's something that you may hear as well. So I think for me, there's a number of rationale, number of reasons for SLT being a great first line therapy. I think we see compliance being an issue, ocular service being an issue. We, have, we, we can better control early on, not worry about patient's compliance as much early on and add drops as needed. You know, I, I think for me, the, the idea of also efficiency and flow is important. We have a difficult time seeing so many patients through our doors every day. And we did a study showing us that when you took one drop away from a patient, we actually save four minutes of tech time, whether it's phone calls, callbacks, pharmacy callbacks, patients were confused about the drop regimens, needing to write them down, confirming at their follow visit. So you can save a significant number of time if you decrease their drop burden, helping your staff and efficiency and flow. So for me, when I look at my paradigm now, it's not just drops, 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 then laser, then MIGS. It's actually laser first, if I can, for most part, MIGS, then laser again. They'll do trap and tube and everything else. I use drug delivery and, and drops as an added and need, like an adjunct throughout the entire paradigm as well. And I think one of the, one of the pearls I've used now is to, to, when I describe and when I try to tell a patient about SLT, I don't use the word laser right away. My advice is to say to a patient, what I want to do is your eye, I want to bring the pressures down the most natural way possible. SLT is a way in the office to use a beam of light that can naturally excite or stimulate your own tissues to release your own enzymes to open those pores naturally internally, let the fluid leave the eye better. It's the most natural, we call physiologic approach to getting rid of the, or getting the pressures down. We can always start drops if we need to, if it doesn't work, but let's try this first. It's covered by insurance here in the United States. And I tell a patient it's a few minute procedure and there's no post-op restrictions afterwards. And so I think for that, when I explain it that way, patients tend to want to have it more than say, I'm going to use a laser to bring your pressures down. They kind of get scared. <laughs> so if they ask me if it's a laser, I do tell them, but I use the word beam of light initially, and that has helped them a great deal. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. I appreciate that. Look forward to answering any questions. I think it's an exciting time in glaucoma. I think it's, it's, it's all about the philosophy, this idea of intervening early on when our target pressures are higher, instead of waiting until patients are obviously suffering or obviously telling us that they're having a hard time or progressing. So earlier adoption of these new technologies like SLT, I think it help a great deal. Thank you once again. Take care of yourself.